Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study. I'm playing a simple book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are in chapter 3, where we're talking about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist uh, came along as an assist to prepare the way for Jesus, the Messiah. Um, he was to prepare the heart, open up the heart. And he did that, and that made his ministry the greatest prophet that Jesus had. That he, he was the greatest prophet for that reason, because he turned the hearts of the people to God. And, um, and that got the attention of the Pharisees. We talked about them, and we're going to see them, of course, throughout the Gospels, um, which in and of itself is amazing because... What you see is the um, Jesus versus religion. And I'm going to say this and can move on. Christianity today um, is mostly religion. Mostly religion. And so uh, people won't like that because it challenged the kind of church, the kind of denomination that you're in and you if if you're honest you will see yourself in the pharisees more than following uh, the teachings of jesus the commands of jesus but i digress i digress uh, the, the current campaign to me proves this it shows this when you look at these religious preachers conservative preachers progressive preachers Whichever side they fall on, it to me proves more that they're more religious <coughs> than they are, excuse me, true followers, true followers of God. They're building the kingdom of America as opposed to the kingdom of God. Again, I digress. John, so he comes along and he begins to preach. And in a sense, making the announcement that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. And he tells them to um, um, prepare their heart. So the big question is, why did John baptize? So for, in order to do that, let's let's go to again. Uh, I'm going to just pick up at verse seven, and it says here, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism. And that's what I want to kind of focus on. Um, but let me go on and read because I'm not going to. I, I covered seven yesterday talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 8 says, um, Therefore, produce fruit. Now I'm going to go back to me. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the place of his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Okay, um, which is kind of interesting of itself. Um, when I go verse by verse through the Bible, uh, so many doctrines intersect here that I that I would love to. I would love to entertain, and the reason why because whenever you're making the case or you're teaching, you don't always think about these verses, but here is a good verse uh, that, you know, you can really talk to Calvinists about. That it, 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 you can, first thing you ask the question, uh, you know, if, if, if God sovereignly chooses some to be saved and sovereignly chooses the rest to be damned, why, well, what is the whole who has warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And can a person who is not chosen flee from the wrath? Okay, so again, I digress. I'm going to do a lot of digressing here. So verse 8 says, Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham, from these stones, even now the axe is is ready to strike 
the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit would be cut down and thrown into the fire. Um, here's another sentence, by the way, um, that again, just in the statement that John is making here. So there's another um, there is another doctrine, and I've dealt with them. That's why I'm thinking that. That's why they're on my mind. But the the the, the debate on what is called once saved, always saved. Now there are those that believe that you cannot. Um, your salvation is not guaranteed. That you could lose your salvation. You're going to walk away from your salvation. If you don't do enough good works, then you can lose your salvation. And one of the arguments that they use, and again, I've dealt with this, so I, I'm not going to go into it, which, God, I would love to. But I, I just, again, as I'm reading through the entire Bible, like I say, when you see a statement like this, you don't always get the chance to, you know, to make these arguments here because, again, and they're just flooded into the scriptures. And and one of the things about the argument of once saved, always saved, for example, they use Hebrew chapter 6 as one. But notice what he says here. Um, in verse 10 he says, Even now the axe is ready to strike at the root of the trees, therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit be cut down. I want to just bring that out because when people use their various scriptures, they never bring out the fact of what exactly is God condemning. He is not condemning condemning a tree that has produced good fruit. And not, in other words, the analogy is not that a tree, in, at least in scripture, that a tree has produced good fruit and then it changes and starts producing bad fruit. That, that is never what scripture, right? That is never what scripture is bringing out. Okay? And so, again, I, this may not make a lot of sense because it makes more sense when I'm making this argument uh, within, the, within the argument, this debate of once saved, always saved. In other, but here's, here's, the, here's the point. Trees, the analogy of trees and vines or whatever bringing forth good fruit always shows and proves you're saved and and that's my point so what when when they say people can lose their salvation he is never talking about a person that is an actual tree bearing actual good fruit so the analogy of a person who was not saved, who was never saved, is a person who never produced good fruit. Now, again, more on that could be explored, but not in this context. Like I said, I have dealt with them, though, uh, you know, in other, um, I, think it, I think it's even titled The One Saved, Always Saved. I got a playlist on that. But anyway, so then he comes down and he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who's coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His, window, his winnowing shovel is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat in the barn with the chaff. He will burn up with fire that never goes out. Now, I want to define baptism because, again, here is another doctrine that has, again, you see these various different doctrines. I'm putting them in the category of pharisaical because they focus one of the problems with man's religion. And I've so far dealt with three of them. Calvinism, uh, and this, um, um, the once saved, always saved debate. Now, 
again, to understand that they believe that you, the once saved, always saved. Those who argue against that once you're saved, you're saved, then their argument is that you're not, you're never saved until the end. You have no assurance of salvation. Um, and then, of course, here, baptism, there are those that believe that you must be baptized in water in order to be saved. And I know one of the denominations that teach this is the Church of Christ, but there are others that teach you must be baptized in water, H2O. And um, this doctrine, again, it's just kind of amazing how silly people could be because they exalt water over the blood of Jesus. Scripture says the blood of Jesus saved. They say, uh-uh, you must get, you must be dunked in H2O to be saved. If you're not dunked in H2O, you cannot go to heaven. You just can't. So I make a lot of very, <coughs> excuse me, interesting questions about that. Does the water have to be clean? In other words, does dirty water save you? Does any kind of water save you? Um, like if you go to a muddy water, like some some missionary baptize people wherever they can, and sometimes they have a muddy, muddy pond. Does that muddy water save you? And um, um, and it's just kind of weird. All of these doctrines, these man-made doctrines, you can trace. By the way, you can trace the origins of the doctrines back to men or a group of men. And then it's there. So these whole theologies are based upon these guys, men, usually. Very few women, but mostly men. And once they are formed, and once these a lot of these doctrines have been going for centuries, in some cases, you cannot break the psychology. Even if you're reading it on the plain reading of the scriptures. So now, baptism, baptize, what does he mean by baptize? Now, on the other side of baptize, baptism, you have different other religions within the Christian sect. And by the way, the term Christian, I am using the word Christian and Christianity. Loosely. So let's be clear, because when I make fun of, when I criticize Christian and Christianity, I purposely use those terms because neither of the terms, Christian and Christianity, was the name designated by God. God never named, the, God never gave the official name to our religion, to the faith. God never gave it as Christianity. Man did that. The term Christian was never given by God. Christians adapted it because it was an insult. Much like we would say today, Jesus freak, Bible thumper. And then you may say, I'll take the insult as a badge of honor. That's what Christians did with the term Christian. God never gave that name to it. Over the time, centuries, it became adopted as the official name of the religion, the followers of Christ, Christianity. Now, it also should be noted by the time that it became the official title to the followers of Christ, it, that is already, it was already corrupted by men in their traditions. Now, one of these things is that you see the term baptized. And you will see this used by Eastern Orthodox, Catholicism, and then other ones, other religions on that side where they, they added a meaning to baptism. And one of the meanings that they added to was that you have this thing, the question is, sprinkle, pour, or immerse. So if you go to um, certain rituals in the Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox and others, 
they may pour or sprinkle. That's the when it comes to infant baptism. Now, another question is, what name do you baptize in? So we go back to our friends here in terms of the water baptism. They'll say, no, 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 you have to baptize in Jesus' name. Okay? You have to baptize in Jesus' name, which is always funny to me because when Jesus says at the end of this book, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, they kind of argue with Jesus. No, 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 you can't, you can't do that. Now, I'll get more into that later. But again, uh, the, the silliness of men in their interpretations, their opinions, their traditions, they make these points. So first and foremost, let's start with the definition of the word used here. And so baptize means immerse. That's what it means. How they came along and added, pour a sprinkling, pour a sprinkling, is not baptizing. If I was to say to you, I'm going to bake a cake, right? So you come over and I say, hey, I want you to watch me bake a cake. Mix up the ingredients, then I put it on top of the stove in a pan throw some grease in it and turn on the grease, heat it up to 450 or whatever you do, and I start frying the cake. You, you would go, what are you doing? I'm baking the cake. You said, no, you're not baking the cake because in order to bake the cake, you have to put it in something, meaning an oven. See what I'm saying? So you can't add deep frying with that. And that's what, and that's what a lot of these religions did with baptism. By, when, by adding pour or sprinkle. There is absolutely no scripture, none. There is no scripture um, showing as an example where someone sprinkled or pour and they call that baptism. Okay? Now, the only scripture I can think of, it would be when Moses sprinkled the blood of the covenant. Uh, when he enacted the old covenant, the Old Testament covenant, the law of Moses, and he enacted that, he took blood and he sprinkled it on the people. However, the, that was never called baptism. It, it was more of a covenant term when he sprinkled the people, but it was never called baptism. But that would be the closest thing that I can think of offhand as to why you would call any kind of sprinkling. Same thing with pouring. There, you, know, you can have examples of in the, the priestly, what they would do and pour, but that was, again, they would pour um, water or something like that, but it was never called baptism. So the word baptism means, and especially the New Testament use, the word that's used means to immerse, means to you have to go into, okay? It means immerse or immersion. So baptism always means immersion. You have to immerse, okay? So, um, but and that's, that, that is the term how, how it is used, okay? And so the one thing that we see throughout both, let's say the Gospels. Now, the Gospels, of course, is really the telling of the same story. So you can say the Gospels and then the book of Acts, uh, that the disciples, the apostles, always immersed. They never sprinkled a pour. They immersed into water, baptism. And we'll pick this up in the next um um, study, okay? And uh, so don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP The Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome, and I will see you in the next study.